17. Bible Roots I build on no authority, ancient or modern, but the scripture. I want to know one thing the way to heaven, how to land on that happy shore. God himself hath condescended to teach the way. He hath written it down in a book. Oh, give me that book. At any price, give me that book of God. John Wesley According to John Wesley's recorded words, he understood the value of the scriptures. He was not referring to the original Greek or Hebrew texts. He knew that God had also given man his word within the pages of a book. Regretfully, man no longer seems willing to accept this simple truth. The book used by John Wesley is the same book that helped establish and guide America's unprecedented achievement of individual soul liberty. It triggered the greatest revivals since the birth of the church age in the first century. But now, this same book has been replaced by hundreds of modernized versions lacking the power of their predecessor. The modern Bible college and seminary influences must be examined to determine how they have helped spawn this move away from the book blessed by God more than any other. For the past several decades, many so-called conservative, fundamental Bible colleges and seminaries have weakened the faith of their students concerning the inerrancy of the scriptures. Most of these schools require their students eager to learn the word of God, to include Greek in their courses of study. The young man is told that Greek is the true language of the New Testament, even though the Bible written in his own native tongue saved him and set his soul aflame. He is placed under a professor who may or may not believe in both the inspiration and the preservation of scripture. The purpose of these courses of study in Greek and Hebrew is not to strengthen the student's faith in God's infallible word, but to teach him to become its judge and jury. The young student's final authority is quickly redirected from the book he once loved and cherished to the Greek faculty and their lexicons. He is soon convinced that he doesn't have the word of God at his disposal and even begins to doubt whether any such authority exists. He is taught that better and more reliable manuscripts have been discovered unavailable to the translators of 1611. Gradually, he becomes convinced that the ignorant masses, uneducated in the original languages, have been led astray from the truth. He now believes that his education is the answer to the church's woes, 2 Timothy 3 verses 1 to 2, 7. On the contrary, this philosophy of education has significantly contributed to the spiritual drought of these last days. Eventually, the cycle continues after the Bible student graduates and moves on to serve in the pastorate. He unintentionally begins to convince his congregation that his knowledge of the original languages makes him spiritually superior to them. Soon, he becomes their final authority, and a clergy slash laity class division begins to emerge. One should recognize the similarities between this unfortunate scenario and that found in Roman Catholicism's exclusive use of the Latin language and the institution of the priesthood system to bind the multitudes to this man-made system. Thus, many Protestant popes emerge, each seeking elevation to a man-made pedestal of his own choosing. When Jesus spoke, the common people heard him gladly, Mark 12 verse 37. In contrast, the majority of the lawyers, schooled in the Levitical law, and religious leaders rejected and resisted him. History repeats itself because there is no new thing under the sun, Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9. Bible colleges and seminaries need to teach the Bible as infallible and the original languages as a means to convince the gainsayers, Titus 1 verse 9, not as a tool to correct that which needs no correction. The moment a person runs to the Greek or Hebrew lexicons he is about to give you is private. Interpretation, 2 Peter 1 verse 20. This is true because the lexicons provide a choice of words that could be used, and he will have to decide which is right. Interestingly, there always seems to be a better word or definition than simply believing the KJB. The misdirection of one's final authority may not be readily apparent, but the confusion caused by the various versions of the Bible is easily recognizable. Are all of the different versions necessary or inspired of God? Do multiple textbooks, Bibles, make sense? Consider this, no teacher would ever teach a history, science, or math class by instructing everyone to bring his favorite textbook version to class. However, most churches repeat this identical situation every Sunday. The preacher preaches out of one version and the people in the pews potentially have a dozen or more other versions from which they follow along, creating chaos and mass confusion, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 33. The King James Bible is the word of God for the English-speaking people. There is no other in use today. 
God provides and Bible believers cite many reasons for this truth. In any analysis, we should first consider the scriptural testimony. The Bible irrefutably tells us that God will preserve His Word and not allow it to pass away. Furthermore, Scripture tells us that God magnified His Word above all of His name. For these reasons and many others, Satan has reveled in creating doubt concerning the authority of the words of God. As we study some of the facts concerning manuscript evidence, the first point to understand is that there are over 5,200 ancient manuscripts in existence today. The vast majority of these manuscripts from all over the world, including Greece, Asia Minor, England, Ireland, Constantinople, Syria, Africa, Gaul, and Southern Italy, support the King James Bible. However, the two ancient manuscripts providing the major foundation for the modern versions come from one locale Alexandria, Egypt. During the early Christian centuries, Egypt was a land in which heresies were rampant. Today, we find that the Muslims are the predominant group controlling this region. The same was true 2,000 years ago except under a different name. One Bible stands alone, originating from a completely separate source from all of the modern versions. The evidence supporting the rejection of the Alexandrian, Egyptian, texts and the acceptance of the manuscripts underlying the KJB is overwhelming. Keep in mind that many works have been dedicated to uncovering the scriptural truths and historical facts presented in summary form here. In any discussion, we must first consider the scripture supporting one's Bible position. The Scriptural Evidence Preservation God promises to preserve His Word for every generation. It is hard to believe how effectively Satan has used our Bible colleges and seminaries to convince many God-called men that God's promises have failed today. Psalm 12 verse 6 The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Seven thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Much like the promises of the Old Testament, the New Testament contains the same promise of supernatural preservation. Contradicting the basic premise for the existence of the modern versions, God promises that His words will not pass away. The Bible does not say that preservation is limited to His thoughts not passing away. Matthew 24 verse 35 Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Modern day Bible critics claim to be restoring God's lost words by creating new Bible versions. This philosophy parallels Joseph Smith's claim of restoring true religion by founding the Church of Latter-day Saints, Mormonism. A common instigator remains hidden behind the scenes creating both false religion and the false Bibles. His satanic influence manifests itself in the production of rotten fruit. Satan magnifies the error whereas God magnifies his true word. The scriptural elevation magnification. Christians sing songs praising the precious name of Jesus Christ. According to God's word, we should be singing songs that not only praise his name, but also magnify his precious word. To magnify means to make greater in size or to appear greater or seem more important than a person or thing is in fact. Either of these definitions plainly reveals God's purpose and plan concerning his word. He wants his word magnified above even his precious name. This may appear foreign to Christians who love their Savior, but it is scriptural and makes sense when considered within a scriptural context. Psalm 138 verse 2 I will worship toward thy holy temple, and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. While on a trip with the Baptist History Preservation Society, I traveled to Barron County, Kentucky. There, I read the Articles of Faith of the Barron River Association adopted in 1830. There were 12 articles listed. The first and second are reproduced below. Pay particular attention to the order the Word of God comes first. These articles demonstrate these Christians' understanding of Psalm 138 verse 2. The Articles of Faith of the Barren River Association, adopted at her constitution at the Mount Pleasant Meeting House, Barron County, Kentucky, September 15, 1830. First, we believe that the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, as translated by the authority of King James, to be the words of God, and is the only true rule of faith and practice. Second, we believe in one only true and living God, Father, Word, and Holy Ghost. Point two. Unlike so many contemporary churches, these men understood the importance divinely intended to be placed upon the Word of God. 
In addition to their magnification of God's word, also take note that this church over 170 years ago believed the King James Bible to be the word of God. Some may respond that these 19th century American Christians did not have all the Bible version choices available to today's Christians. Amen. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 33. Satan's plan a subtle attack. The fall of man began with this question from the subtle serpent, yeah, hath God said. Genesis 3 verse 1. This same question has been posed by every new Bible version marketed to a new generation of consumers. As a great preacher of old said, the approved method of the present carnival of unbelief is not to reject the Bible altogether but to raise doubts as to portions of it. Once doubts concerning the efficacy and inerrancy of the Bible arise, the individual falls prey to a never-ending search for truth. The Bible critic naively fulfills prophecy, ever learning, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, 2 Timothy 3 verse 7. The Lord Jesus Christ warned of Satan's mode of attack, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God, then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word. Luke 8 verses 11 to 12. The easiest way to deceptively take something away is to replace it with something seemingly similar. Replacing the genuine article with a counterfeit works effectively. Whether the counterfeit be the RV, Goodspeed, Riverside, American, Moffat, ASV, Williams, RSV, Phillips, Berkeley, NEV, NWT, Good News, NASV, New World, Amplified, Living, 4, NIV, NKJV, New Schofield, NCV, CV, New Living, ESV, etc., etc., etc. Of necessity, every counterfeit must look like the real thing. Initially, the modern versions never remove every single instance of a particular doctrine. Thus, the changes incorporated into the new versions are somewhat limited, though key doctrines are systematically attacked. The changes become progressively more pervasive as the public becomes accustomed to accepting change and becomes further removed from the content of the actual words of God. The true scriptures give us multiple witnesses, thus confirming God's system of judgment and justice. Consider Matthew 18 verse 16, two or three witness requirement, and Ecclesiastes 4 verse 12, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. For this reason, God includes multiple witnesses to his truths. Satan has not altered his strategy much over the centuries. He still tries to deceive God's creation, Revelation 12 verse 9. If he attacked the word of God in the Garden of Eden and used God's very words to tempt God himself in the wilderness, he will use the same methods today. The Bible describes his satanic modus operandi. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3 Satan still effectively deceives the unsuspecting. Too many Christians have disappeared from the spiritual battle by forgetting the identity of the one with whom they contend, Ephesians 6 verse 12. Because of a rejection of the truth through sin and rebellion, the prophet Amos foretells of the day when men will hunger, not for food, but for the word of God. Although Amos prophesy foretells God's judgment upon Israel, we have a similar situation occurring in churches today. Truly, history does repeat itself. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord, and they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. Amos 8 verses 11 to 12. Since the 1880s, over 200 different English versions of the Bible have appeared, see listing in one book one authority. Has God authored each and every one of these? God could not have authored all of these contradictory versions, for God is not the author of confusion. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 33. The identity of the author of confusion becomes apparent by reading the scripture. He is the same one who confused and beguiled even the garden, who used the scripture to tempt our Lord and Savior in the wilderness, and who has blinded man and initiated his search for the ever-elusive true word of God. The Bible's family tree simplified. The best place to start is at the beginning. The original autographs refer to the actual manuscripts penned by the writers of each of the 66 books of the Bible. They were written in manuscript form by one of God's apostles or his prophets. The original autograph was given to the nation of Israel, Old Testament, or a local New Testament church. 
Some New Testament epistles were sent to individuals such as Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. God, in his infinite wisdom and foreknowledge, primarily chose the Hebrew and Koine Greek languages to be used for the originals of the Old and New Testaments, respectively. Both of these tongues became dead languages within several hundred years after each respective canon was established. For this reason, the words actually became frozen in time. Thus, the words and their meanings could not change. They became, as Latin, dead languages with fixed properties of meaning. In contrast, English is a living language. As such, new words are constantly being added to the English language and old words remain in a state of flux. Point three, for instance, the fourth edition of the American Heritage Dictionary, released in the year 2000, advertises its product with the following quote, this edition has nearly 10,000 new words and senses that reflect the rapid pace of change in the English language today, for unlike the modern versions, the King James Bible was translated at a time when English was in its purest form. Since that time, the English language has progressively degenerated from what it was in 1611 to what it is today. Should God's word be forced to embody the degeneration of the language? These original manuscripts, autographs, penned by the authors wore out from constant use. When certain other tribes, synagogues, churches, etc. desired a copy of a sacred writing, a copy was produced for them. These copies are called manuscripts because they were written with pen and ink prior to the advent of the printing press and typesetting. Frequently, scribes were known to have destroyed old, worn manuscripts after the new copies had been made, a process analogous to our disposal of a weathered flag. These scribes were not concerned with holding on to the originals because they had faithfully copied the text. This faithful copying resulted in the faithful promulgation of God's word to subsequent generations. The only alternative explanation of the history of the Bible is that God's promise has failed and the words of God have indeed passed away, Matthew 24 verse 35. Other tribes, synagogues, churches, etc. made copies of these manuscripts until, eventually, copies of the sacred writings had been distributed worldwide. The written word of God spread in much the same way as the verbal word of God spread in the first century. Acts 6 verse 7 and the word of God increased. Acts 12 verse 24 but the word of God grew and multiplied. Acts 13 verse 49 and the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. Warning, Satan's henchmen were busy creating and copying some manuscripts at this time, too. Church history and the Bible warn about early corruption of the words of God. For instance, the Apostle Paul warns Christians in the first century of Satan's devices, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God speak we in Christ, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17. Floyd Nolan Jones' apt description of the early days of New Testament corruption contradicts the standard Bible critic's position. Hort said there were no signs of deliberate altering of the text for doctrinal purposes, but the scriptures and the church fathers disagree with him. Again, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17 says that many were corrupting the scriptures during the time of Paul. From the letters and works of the fathers, we know of Mark Ion the Gnostic who deliberately altered the text for doctrinal purposes as early as 140 AD. Other corruptors of scripture were named by the mid-2nd century by these church fathers. For example, Dionysius, Bishop of Corinth from AD 168 to 176, said that the scriptures had been deliberately altered in his day. Many modern scholars recognized that most variations were made deliberately. 5. God's line of manuscripts versus Satan's line of manuscripts. The copies that were proven to be good copies were received by the synagogues and local churches and became known as the received text. Of the 5,262 Greek witnesses to the text of the New Testament, 80% are in full agreement with the true text, a full 90% of the witnesses agree 97% of the time. In addition, all 2,143 Greek lectionaries support the received text underlying the King James Bible. Lectionaries are manuscripts containing scripture lessons read publicly in the churches. In other words, the churches that utilize the lectionaries all use the text that gave birth to the King James Bible. In 1382, John Wycliffe gave his people their first English translation of the Bible. He became known as the Morning Star of the Reformation. 
Regretfully, because of his lack of knowledge in Greek and Hebrew, he based his work primarily on the Latin manuscripts, such as the Old Latin Bible, not Jerome's corrupt Latin Vulgate of 408 AD. Fox confirms Wycliffe's use of the Latin in his comments about William Tyndall. Tyndall was the first individual to return to the original languages of Hebrew and Greek. All of the English versions before Tyndall were translations of a translation, all derived from the Old Latin versions.2. Wycliffe was hated for his attempt to give the common people the words of God in the English language. In 1415, he was posthumously condemned for heresy by Pope Martin V at the Council of Constance. The council ordered his bones exhumed and burned. The orders were carried out in 1428 when they unearthed his bones, burned them to ashes, and threw them into the River Swift. In 1516, a scholar named Desiderius Erasmus, 1466-1536, was led of God to produce the first printed edition of the Greek New Testament. Although he did not have a complete text, he used the manuscripts available to him to produce a Greek New Testament, which later became known as the Textus Receptus. Some claim that his work was inferior because he was supposedly ignorant of the competing text types. This is simply false. Documentation exists to prove that he did in fact have knowledge of the Vaticanus manuscript and had regular correspondence with Professor Paulus Bombagius, the papal librarian, concerning it. And furthermore, a Catholic priest named Juan Sepulveda sent extracts of the Codex Vaticanus to Erasmus in an attempt to convince him of its superiority. Point two, after considering the material provided him, Erasmus rejected the Vaticanus as a variant text type. Vaticanus is discussed further under Satan's line of manuscripts. Thus, 100 years prior to the King James Bible, Erasmus knew of the text used by modern Bible critics but considered Vaticanus, as well as the other Alexandrian texts to be spurious. Erasmus was the most unlikely candidate to be used of God. Yet, he was uniquely qualified. Who better to expose the fallacies of Roman Catholicism than one completely familiar with its ways? Although Erasmus had been raised and trained by Catholic monks, he was a man of true character. He spent his life writing about and protesting the false doctrines of the Roman Catholic system. His true friends were the Protestant scholars among whom he lived and died. Cambridge historian Owen Chadwick said he was an ex-monk, a Protestant pastor preached his funeral sermon and the money he left was used to help Protestant refugees, ten he was buried at a Protestant church in Basel. Erasmus shows up on Sebastian Frank's list of heretics of the Roman Catholic institution. 11. The Council of Trent condemned Erasmus' translation of the Bible because it did not match their corrupt Vulgate translation, but rather the text of true Christianity. In 1559, the Pope placed Erasmus' writings on the Index of Forbidden Books, just as the Word of God had been placed on that list in 1229.12 The Council of Toulouse, which met in November of 1229 about the same time as the Crusade against the Albigensians, set up a special ecclesiastical tribunal, or court, known as the Inquisition to search out and try heretics. Twenty of the forty-five articles decreed by the Council dealt with heresy. It ruled in part. Canon 2 The lords of the districts shall carefully seek out the heretics in dwellings, hovels, and forests, and even their underground retreats shall be entirely wiped out. Canon 14 We prohibit the permission of the books of the Old and New Testament to laymen, except perhaps they might desire to have the Psalter, or some breviary for the divine service, or the hours of the Blessed Virgin Mary, for devotion, expressly forbidding their having the other parts of the Bible translated into the vulgar tongue. 13. No matter how much Rome fought against those who tried to spread the word of God throughout the world, truth still prevailed. The Textus Receptus was eventually translated into other languages, including French, Dutch, Danish, and Czech. Other well-known Bibles were also produced from Erasmus' work. These included the Swedish Uppsala Bible, the Spanish Reina, the Italian Diodati Version and Martin Luther's German Bible. The English Bible purified seven times? Many Bible believers teach that the book of Psalms prophesies of God's supernatural intervention and preservation of his word in the English language. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Psalm 12 verse 6. Some people doubt that God would prophesy concerning the English, but God has done this on several occasions. There were six distinct editions leading up to our King James Bible, beginning in 1525 with Tyndall's Bible. 
The shortcomings of the earlier versions were commonly recognized, yet the Lord used each of these earlier works together for the greatest creation since Genesis chapter 1. If any of these earlier versions were the final English version, God would not have led in the creation of one final version, exiling the others to historical obscurity. The seventh was the King James Bible of 1611. The 14 rules of translation provided to the King James translators demonstrate the premise for this position. The 14th rule names the six translations considered by the KJB Translation Committee as true well-suited predecessors of the King James Bible. The translations to be used when they agree better with the text than the Bishop's Bible are the Tyndall Bible, Matthew Bible, Coverdale Bible, Whitchurch Bible, which is also known as the Cranmer's or Great Bible printed by Whitchurch, and the Geneva Bible. These rules also show that justification exists for excluding the Catholic Douay Reims version and the Wycliffe Bible from the foundational versions since they were translated from the Latin. The seven stages of purification are detailed as follows. 1. Tyndall, 1525, William Tyndall was known as the father of the English Bible. He spoke seven different languages fluently, Hebrew, Greek, Latin, Italian, Spanish, English, and French, and was the sole translator of the first printed English New Testament. He had a price on his head and was hunted for 11 years by his king and the papacy. On October 6, 1536, he was tied to a stake, strangled, and consumed with fire. Before his strangling, he was given one last chance to recant, but refused to do so. He was allowed a moment to pray and cried out, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. 14 God answered his prayer when King Henry officially sanctioned the publishing of two separate Bibles in the English language within a year of Tyndall's martyrdom. 15. 2. Coverdale, 1535. The Coverdale Bible was named after Tyndall's former proofreader at Antwerp Miles Coverdale. He produced the first complete printed English Bible. His work consisted primarily of Tyndall's New Testament and Pentateuch, with the remaining Old Testament books rendered primarily from Luther's German translation. He omitted the marginal notes associated with the Tyndall Bible. King Henry officially sanctioned the second edition printed in 1537. Rome tried unsuccessfully to silence Coverdale. He escaped only days before they would have captured him. 3. Matthews, 1537, John Rogers, using the pseudonym of Thomas Matthews, continued Tyndall's work while Tyndall was imprisoned in a dungeon. After the death of Edward VI in 1553, Queen Mary assumed the throne with the ambition of burning every Protestant who would not recant and submit to the Church of Rome. John Rogers was burned first because he was the closest to William Tyndall. Over 300 leading Protestant scholars in England were burned at the stake during Bloody Mary's four-year reign. Many of the others fled to Geneva, Switzerland. 4. Great, 1538. This translation was named the Great Bible because of its exceptional size 16 12 inches by 11 inches. This Bible was a revision of the Matthews Bible, not including Roger's marginal notes. Henry VIII authorized by royal injunction the printing of 20,000 copies of this translation for distribution to every church in England. It has the distinction of being the first Bible officially authorized for public use in England's churches. Thus, Tyndall's dying prayer was quickly answered. 5. Geneva, 1560, Theodore Beza, John Knox, William Whittingham, and Miles Coverdale labored six years to produce the Geneva Bible. This translation included thousands of explanatory notes which promoted study and understanding of the text. The Geneva Bible was the first to feature numbered verses and italics, and the first English Bible translated entirely from the original languages. 16 It is quoted over 5,000 times in the plays of William Shakespeare. 17 The Geneva Bible came to America with John Smith in 1607, and later on board the Mayflower with the Pilgrims. Six. Bishops, 1568, the changes instituted in the Bishop's Bible were mostly cosmetic, including many pictures, and thicker, more expensive paper. The Geneva Bible remained the People's Bible until the 1611 authorized version. 7. King James, 1611, the King James Version of the Bible became the seventh purification of the English translation and is as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. The Puritans vowed to remove the remnants of Roman Catholicism from the Church of England. 
Thus, Dr. John Reynolds, president of Corpus Christi College at Oxford, suggested to King James that a translation be produced that the common people could understand, read, and love. This undertaking began when approximately 1,000 ministers sent a petition to King James. 18. It was finally agreed that a new translation, absolutely true to the original Greek text, be made which would not include any marginal notes or comments. 1. Oh, no marginal notes were incorporated into this translation, except for explanations of Greek or Hebrew words and the provision of cross-references. In 1604, a group of 54 of the best scholars in England were chosen to begin a new translation into English. In 1611, they completed the book that later became known as the Authorized Version. The early editions of the Authorized Version included the Apocrypha. They included these books between the canonical Old and New Testament books to show that they were not inspired. All of the apocryphal books were written in Greek, with the exception of one written in Latin. A 1613 edition of the KJB was printed excluding the Apocrypha. It is interesting to note that the apocryphal books were distributed within the text of the Old Testament Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, and the other Egyptian manuscripts favored by the modern versions and the modern-day textual critics. Point 20. In the book, From the Mind of God to the Mind of Man, Paul Downey gives the distorted impression that the King James translators failed to distinguish between the non-canonical apocrypha and the inspired scripture of the Old. 21. He fails to. And New Testaments. He states that the authorized version of 1611 had followed the Council of Trent. Point out that the apocryphal books were included in the KJB as they were in all other versions of the English Bible from the time of Wycliffe, 1384. Furthermore, the Council of Trent officially pronounced many of the apocryphal books as inspired and canonical. That was not the position of the King James Bible translators. Satan's Line of Manuscripts in 1475, a manuscript was logged into the Vatican Library known as Codex Vaticanus. It was rediscovered almost four centuries later, in 1845, and has become instrumental in influencing modern scholarship. It dates to around A.D. 350. In 1844, a second Alexandrian manuscript, called Codex Sinaiticus, was discovered in a monastery at the foot of M.T. Sinai. This manuscript also dates to about A.D. 350. Many scholars believe that these copies are two of the 50 copies that the Emperor Constantine instructed Eusebius to prepare for the new churches he planned to build in Constantinople. Thus, Origen, the Gnostic, influenced Eusebius, and he influenced the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus manuscripts, and in turn every modern version taken from these two manuscripts was corrupted. Neither the Vaticanus nor the Sinaiticus was accepted as a received text. Thousands of changes have been noted within their pages by many different scribes throughout history. In 1853, two men named Brooke Foss Westcott and Fenton John Anthony Hort set out to write a Greek text based on these two Alexandrian texts, Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus. Since these two texts by then disagreed with each other in some 3,036 places in the four gospel books alone, the two men had to come up with a completely subjective text influenced by their heretical views. Consequently, they wrote an eclectic text, meaning they preferentially picked and chose certain portions of scripture from the Vaticanus manuscript and other portions. From the Sinaiticus manuscript until they produced a rendering that satisfactorily conveyed their doctrines. But, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. 2 Peter 1 verse 20 Scrivener reported 15,000 alterations in the text of Sinaiticus brought in by at least 10 different revisers, some of them systematically spread over every page, others occasional or limited to separate portions of the manuscript, many of them being contemporaneous with the first writer, far the greater part belonging to the 6th or 7th century, a few being as recent as the 12th. 22. Therefore, it stands to reason that no matter how closely Vaticanus and Sinaiticus once agreed, with so many alterations these witnesses could no longer agree. Regarding the thousands of changes in the 7th century, Scrivener wrote, the one object of this corrector was to assimilate the codex to manuscripts more in vogue in his time and approaching far nearer to our modern textus receptus. 23. In 1898, a revision of Westcott and Hort's Greek text was made and called Nestle's Greek text. 
The majority of Bible colleges today use Nestle's Greek text, the Aland Nestle 26 or the UBS 3, although it differs greatly from the Textus Receptus. Despite this fact, the new versions arise from these corrupted texts, while the King James Bible stands alone in its similarities to the Textus Receptus and its rejection of the readings from the corrupt texts. Note, UBS 3 stands for the third edition of the United Bible Society. Westcott and Hort had some extremely flawed methods for determining which Greek text to choose when there was a variant reading. They chose the neutral approach. Basically, this meant that the variant, the difference between the Greek texts, was approached from the perspective that the reading that should be chosen would be the one that reflects the least doctrinal bias, i.e. the one that is most neutral. For instance, they chose to use the word who or he in 1 Timothy 3 verse 16 rather than God, used in the Textus Receptus, because they hypothesized that some well, meaning scribe inserted God into the passage. According to their theory, doctrinal variants were caused by God's people, rather than those who had set out to corrupt the scripture, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17. This is preposterous and anti-scriptural. 26. A typical proponent of this philosophy, James White, justifies the changes in the modern versions using various and proven hypotheses such as scribal expansion, 24 parallel passage corruption, 25 scribal harmonization, parallel corruption, 27 and parallel influence. 28. Johann Jacob Griesbach concurs with this theory that the corrupted text is the one that contains a dogmatic position on doctrine. Read the illogical conclusions for yourself. When there are many variant readings in one place, that reading which more than the others manifestly favors dogmas of the orthodox is deservedly regarded as suspicious.29. If the subject were not so serious, this absurd position would be humorous. Such a theory certainly has no basis in the spiritual realm. We are not talking about just any book. We are discussing a book that Satan hates. Ignorance of the truth has always been his greatest ally. To attribute the changes to well-meaning godly men, rather than to satanic influence borders on lunacy. Dr. Samuel Jipp succinctly speaks from the Bible-believing, spiritual perspective. If Satan can eliminate the Bible, he can break our lifeline to heaven. If he can only get us to doubt its accuracy, he can successfully foil God's every attempt to teach us.30. Westcott and Hort's theory of corruption has been proven false by irrefutable documentation and evidence. Dean Bergen dedicated 84 pages of evidence to support the KJB rendering of 1 Timothy 3 verse 16 God was manifest in the flesh, and to invalidate the modern version rendering of He who was manifest in the flesh. Out of 254 manuscripts and translations in other languages personally examined by Dean John Bergen, 252 contained a reading supporting the KJB.31 This equates to greater than 99% agreement with the King James reading and less than 1% siding with the readings found in the modern versions. Compare the magnitude of evidence from the correct reading with the typical footnote found in most modern versions, some manuscripts read God. The modern version editors fail to tell you that the two manuscripts supporting the corrupt reading are the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. According to the critics' theory, these two manuscripts should be given precedence because they do not contain as dogmatic a doctrinal stand. Here is the standard line of the liberals and neo-fundamentalists as excerpted from the book, From the Mind of God to the Mind of Man. The discovery of some ancient Greek manuscripts late in the 19th century produced a revolution in the understanding of the Greek New Testament. These discoveries have changed the editing of Greek texts into a new quest to define the original text. These texts are based on new witnesses not previously known and new approaches to interpreting the variations. Beginning in the 1880s, printed Greek New Testaments were developed with significant differences from the traditional Textus Receptus Greek text. 32. According to this modern philosophy, God's promise of providential preservation of the scriptures failed until Tischendorf, Trigels, and Westcott and Hort providentially discovered it in the mid-19th century. Consider the dire implications the text used by the true churches for 1,500 years and the same one that aided the cause of the Protestant Reformation was really not the preserved text. Instead, infidels rediscovered it during a time of great unbelief, the time of evolution, liberalism, Freud, and Marx. True biblical historians trace the great confusion and discord among believers today back to this period of uncertainty and unbelief. Scriptural support for rejection of Alexandrian, Egyptian, 
texts. From the scripture that follows, one can easily see that the Lord dispels any notion that Egypt should be treated as any other country. This is the very land from which the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus manuscripts originated. One can be certain that he did not send his Levitical scribes to Egypt and bless them there with the task of preserving his holy word. Instead, the Lord says he is going to consume, kill, them all. He wants his people out of Egypt. Jeremiah 44 verse 26 Therefore hear ye the word of the Lord, all Judah that dwell in the land of Egypt. Behold, I have sworn by my great name, saith the Lord, that my name shall no more be named in the mouth of any man of Judah in all the land of Egypt, saying, The Lord God liveth. His name will not be named by those Israelites dwelling in the land of Egypt. The Egyptians, of course, are Arabs. Most of the Arab countries are determined to eradicate the nation of Israel at any cost. Some might point to Anwar Sadat of Egypt as a leader of an Arab nation willing to consider peace with Israel. Consider this politician. The first year he became premier of Egypt, he led Egypt into war with Israel. The encyclopedia calls him a pragmatist, i.e. he could not wipe out Israel so he would try to negotiate. A pragmatist, Sadat indicated his willingness to consider a negotiated settlement with Israel and shared the 1978 Nobel Peace Prize with Menachem Begin as a result of the Camp David Accords. He was assassinated by Muslim extremists who were opposed to his peace initiative with Israel. 33. Now consider the background. Sadat signed a peace treaty with Israel in 1979 and was assassinated two years later. He was assassinated because of the peace treaty, and the assassination occurred while he was reviewing a military parade that marked the 8th anniversary of the crossing of the Suez Canal. In other words, he won the Nobel Peace Prize, but continued to celebrate his country's attack on Israel. Is he a good example of Egypt's acceptance of Israel? He was a politician who did things that were politically expedient. Muslims hate Israel, America, and anything non-Muslim. The scripture continues its condemnation of the Jews in Egypt. Jeremiah 44 verse 27 Behold, I will watch over them for evil, and not for good, and all the men of Judah that are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword and by the famine, until there be an end of them. God allows us to find the truth through a search of the scriptures. The Lord wanted his people out of Egypt. He consumed any of them who remained there. The modern critic wants us to believe that God then used the same region to preserve his word through the Roman Catholic Vaticanus and Sinaiticus manuscripts. God emphatically differentiates between his words and those of the Jewish Egyptians. Jeremiah 44 verse 28 Yet a small number that escaped the sword shall return out of the land of Egypt into the land of Judah, and all the remnant of Judah that are gone into the land of Egypt to sojourn there shall know whose word shall stand, mine, or theirs. It sounds as if God ensured that the remnant of Judah would be able to differentiate between his words and theirs. It is unfortunate that man does not seem to possess the same capacity to discern truth from error today. Consider some of the other biblical passages which cast a definite negative light on Egypt. Genesis 12:10-13 Because of the Egyptians, Abraham is concerned for his life and the safety of his wife. Also note that this concerns the genealogical line of Christ. Matthew 1 verses 1 to 2. Genesis 37:36 Joseph is sold into Egypt as a slave. Did Egypt bring upon itself the curse of God pronounced against all those that curse Israel? Genesis 12 verse 3. Genesis 50 colon 25 dash 26 The first book of the Bible ends with Joseph's being placed into a coffin in Egypt. Exodus 1 colon 11 Israel is persecuted in Egypt. Genesis 12 verse 3. Exodus 12 colon 12 God passed through the land and killed all the firstborn of Egypt, judging all their gods. Exodus 20 colon 2 Egypt is called the house of bondage. Deuteronomy 4 colon 20 Egypt is called the iron furnace. Deuteronomy 17 colon 16 The Lord ends the warning by stating, Ye shall henceforth return no more that way. Jeremiah 42 colon 13 dash 19 God warns Judah pointedly, Go ye not into Egypt, know certainly that I have admonished you this day. Jeremiah 46 colon 25 God promises punishment on Egypt. Ezekiel 20 colon 7 God commands Israel not to be associated with Egypt's idolatry. Hosea 11 colon 1 God called his son out of Egypt. Revelation 11 colon 8 God compares Jerusalem in apostasy to Sodom and Egypt. 
In spite of all of the scriptural evidence against the possibility of God's using Egypt to preserve his word, the Bible critics continue to hold to this unscriptural position. The following comments plainly reveal their position. According to an article written by Gary Hudson, Bob Ross theorizes the following concerning Egypt. We should also remember the wonderful providence of the Lord in regard to Moses, Joseph, and the Israelites in Egypt, as well as how the infant Jesus was taken to Egypt as a means of escaping death in Israel during the time of Herod's campaign of infanticide. The Lord is sovereign in Egypt as well as in Antioch, Jerusalem, and Rome. He works his wonders all over. In fact, if you had to have the right place in which the Lord could do his work, it would have to be a wrong place, as the whole world is defiled by sin. 34. In other words, the right place would have to be the wrong place to make it the right place. This position ignores God's specific condemnation. Read Jeremiah chapter 44 again. This theory makes as much sense as attributing all the variations between the Textus Receptus and the modern versions to God's people. According to the critics, the modern versions are necessary because God chose Egypt and Roman Catholicism to preserve his word which had been corrupted by well-meaning, overzealous scribes. Sounds like some of the logic displayed in the Garden of Eden. God's promise of supernatural preservation has not failed during the last century. Man needs to believe the book God has provided, rather than trying to correct that which needs no correction. God used Antioch, Acts 11 verse 26, not Alexandria, Egypt, Acts 27 colon 6, 28 colon 11, to preserve his word. As we look at the cast of characters in the next chapter, consider which group was most likely entrusted by God to keep his beloved word. 1 Baptist History Preservation Society, 504, Grace Avenue, Kannapolis, North Carolina, 28083. Jeff Faggart, Founder 704-938-1335. 2 C. P. Carthorn and W. L. Warnell, Pioneer Church Records of South Central Kentucky in the Upper Cumberland of Tennessee, 1799-1899-1985, reprinted by Church History Research and Archives, Dayton, Ohio, page 23. 3. Jones, Op. Sit, page 10, 11. For the American Heritage Dictionary of the English Language, 4th edition. Copyright 2000 by Houghton Mifflin Company. Published by the Houghton Mifflin Company. 5. Jones, Op. Sit, page 134. 6. Grady, Final Authority, Op. Sit, page 28. Z. John Fox et al., Fox's Christian Martyrs of the World, Westwood, New Jersey, Barber and Company, 1985, page 362. 8. Samuel Prito Tregels, an account of the printed text of the Greek New Testament with remarks on its revision upon critical principle together with a collation of critical texts, London, Samuel Baxter & Sons, 1854, page 22. 9. Marvin R. Vincent, A History of the Textual Criticism of the New Testament, New York, Macmillan, 1899, page 53, FHA. Scrivener, A Plain Introduction to the Criticism of the New Testament, 4th edition, ed. Edward Miller, 2 volumes, London, George Bell & Sons, 1894, volume 1, page 109. 10. Owen Chadwick, A History of Christianity, New York, St. Martin's Press, 1995, page 198. 11. Roland Bainton, Erasmus of Christendom, New York, Scribner's, 1969, page 257. 12. Ibid, pages 277 to 278. 13. Pierre Elix, Ecclesiastical History of Ancient Churches of the Albigenses, published in Oxford at the Clarendon Press in 1821, reprinted in USA in 1989 by Church History Research and Archives, P.O. Box 38, Dayton, Ohio, 45449, page 213. 14. Fox, Fox's Book of Martyrs, edited by William Byron Forbush, D.D., Grand Rapids, Michigan, Zondervan Publishing House, 1967, page 184. 15. Grady, Final Authority, Op. Sit, pages 137 to 138. 16. Ibid, pages 139 to 140. 17. The Forbidden Book, New Liberty Videos. 18. Alexander McClure, The Translators Revived, Litchfield, Michigan, Maranatha Bible Society, 1858, page 57. 19. Ibid, pages 58 to 59. 
20 Samuel C. Jip, An Understandable History of the Bible, 2nd Edition, Northfield, Ohio, Daystar Publishing, 2000, page 335. 21 From the Mind of God to the Mind of Man, James B. Williams, Edition, Op. Sit, page 45. 22 Prebendary Scrivener, Full Collation of the Codex Sinaiticus with the Received Text of the New Testament, Introduction, page 19. 23 Cecil J. Carter, The Anti-King James Version Conspiracy, Prince George, B.C., Canada, 1997, page 27. 24 White, The King James Only Controversy, Op. Sit, page 252. 25 Ibid, page 253. 26 Ibid, page 254. 27 Ibid, page 257. 28 Ibid, page 264. 29 JJ. Griesbach, Novum Testamentum Greece, Halley, 1796, page 62. 30 Samuel C. Jip, An Understandable History of the Bible, 1st Edition, 1987, page 26. 31 Bergen, Revision Revised, page 492. 32 Williams, From the Mind of God to the Mind of Man, Opposite, page 171. 33 Encyclopedia.com 34 Gary Hudson King James Onlyism and the Egyptian Corruption Argument 18. Noteworthy versus Notorious Every time we hire a scholar we need to have a revival. Dr. Bob Jones, senior many modern version proponents, including Mr. James White, claim that no conspiracy exists, particularly one intending to pervert the words of the living God. This may be true in isolated instances, however, Mr. White fails to warn concerning the underlying manuscripts corrupted by the devious, dishonest, and deceived. Thus, the errors of Origen, Semler, Kittle, Westcott, Hort, and a cast of other infidels have infiltrated the modern versions through their corrupt sources. Many books and writings have thoroughly documented Satan's influence upon these men and a host of others like them. For example, does your Bible version cast suspicion upon the following verses in its footnotes Matthew 12 47, 17 21, 1811, 21 44, 23 14, Mark 7 16, 9 44, 9 46, 11 26, 15 28, 16 colon 9 20, Luke 17 36, 22 colon 43 44, 23 17, John 5 colon 4, 753 to 811, Acts 8 37, 1534, 24 colon 7, 28 colon 29, Romans 16 verse 24. The following NIV footnote is representative of the doubt cast upon the Word of God. The earliest and most reliable manuscripts and other witnesses do not have John 753 to 811. 1. This footnote, along with many similar ones, reveals how the modern version producers are smitten by the two major critical Greek manuscripts of Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. The noteworthy versus notorious should become evident by determining which side of the modern version controversy each individual lands. By considering the points made by the following Bible version checklist, modern version users can determine how their particular version of choice stacks up. Answers to the following checklist will help determine whether any particular version follows God's line of manuscripts or Satan's. Bible Version Checklist I. Does your version make Jesus a sinner when he gets angry in Mark 3 verse 5 and John 2 verse 15? Every modern version that removes the phrase without a cause in Matthew 5 verse 22 makes Jesus a sinner for getting angry. B. Does your version change Lucifer to morning star or day star in Isaiah 14 verse 12 when Revelation 22 verse 16 clearly identifies Jesus Christ as the morning star? And 2 Peter 1 verse 19 identifies him as the day star. C. Does your version change the word prophets to Isaiah in Mark 1 verse 2 when the verse quoted actually comes from Malachi 3 verse 1, thus necessitating the use of the plural use of prophets as found in the KJB and not a single book, Isaiah? D. Does your version say that Elhanan killed Goliath in 2 Samuel 21 verse 19 when everybody knows David killed him? E. Does your version omit the last 14 words of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6 verse 13? F. Does your version reveal that people worshipped the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 18 verse 26 and Matthew 20 verse 20? G. Does your version add nor the Son to Matthew 24 verse 36 as an interpolation from other passages? 
H. Does your version omit the Lordship of Jesus Christ in any of these verses, Mark 9 verse 24, Luke 23 verse 42, and Romans? 1 colon 3. I. Does your version make it hard for everyone to enter the kingdom of God in Mark 10 verse 24? J. Does your version cast doubt on the virgin birth of Christ by calling Joseph his father in Luke 2 verse 33? K. Does your version tell you what to live by in Luke 4 verse 4? 1. Does your version cast doubt once again on the deity of Christ by calling him a chosen one in Luke 9 verse 35? M. Is Jesus the only begotten Son of God in John 1 verse 14 and 18, John 3 verse 16 and 18, and 1 John 4 verse 9? N. Does your version forget to tell you in whom to believe in John 6 verse 47? O. Does your version admit that Jesus is in heaven in John 3 verse 13, John 16 verse 16, and 1 John 5 verse 7? P. Does your version reduce Jesus to God's servant rather than his son in Acts 3.13, 3.26, 4.27, or 4.30? Q. Does the Ethiopian eunuch get saved in Acts 8 verse 37 in your version? Or does his baptism directly follow his question without reference to his being saved? Or does anyone fast in the following verses? Acts 10 verse 30, 1 Corinthians 7 verse 5, 2 Corinthians 6 verse 5, or 2 Corinthians 11 verse 27? S. Does Christ have a judgment seat in your version of Romans 14 verse 10? The KJB says that we give an account of ourselves to God, verses 12, at the judgment seat of Christ, verses 10, again proving the deity of Christ. T. Does your version promote pride and boasting by changing 2 Corinthians 1 verse 12 and 14, 5 12, 7 colon 4, Galatians 6 verse 4, and James 1 verses 9 to 10? U. Does your version place Jesus at the scene of the creation in Ephesians 3 verse 9 or Hebrews 2 verse 7? V. Is Jesus robbed of his deity again in Philippians 2 verse 6? W. Does your version exalt the deity of Christ by admitting that God laid down his life for us in 1 John 3 verse 16? X. Can you find the Trinity in 1 John 5 verse 8? Y. Does your version contain footnotes such as, some manuscripts say, or the oldest and best say? Does this not leave you to your own private interpretation of scripture, contrary to 2 Peter 1 verse 20? Z. Does your version contain the command to study it and the revelation of how to do so in 2 Timothy 2 verse 15? This Bible version checklist offers a snapshot of a few of the problems related to the majority of modern versions. The KJB was accepted as the final authority for over 300 years before the new versions became popular during the last few generations. Who has instigated all of the confusion resulting from a multitude of versions? The basic premise of Westcott and Hort suggested that Christians deliberately altered the scripture with pure motives. They also insisted that men such as Adamantius Origen, a Gnostic who did not believe in the deity of Christ, were the ones responsible for causing the scripture to be restored after it was lost for some 1,500 years. According to these men, the text used by the Protestant reformers was the most unreliable because the true text was not restored until the late 19th century when the Pope brought the Vaticanus manuscript out of his library and truth was rescued by Titian out of a monastery trash can. Where is the providence of God? Where is the spiritual discernment of God's people? Does it make sense that good, godly scribes corrupted the text and that infidels rescued it? Pause for a moment and reflect on the absurdity of this position. Now, we turn our attention to some of the issues not completely covered thus far. Copyrights on derivative works. All Bible versions are derivative works because they are adapted from other works. In many ways, they are similar to a play written about a book by another author. To be copyrightable, a derivative work must be different enough from the original to be regarded as a new work or must contain a substantial amount of new material. Making minor changes or additions of little substance to a pre-existing work will not qualify the work as a new version for copyright purposes. In other words, the modern versions must by law read differently from their predecessor versions in order to qualify for another copyright. In order to protect their financial investment and receive income from their work, Bible publishers must copyright their work. Every modern version has a financial copyright and thus an owner. According to the New Standard Encyclopedia, a copyright is the legal protection given to authors and artists to prevent reproduction of their work without their consent. 
The owner of a copyright has the exclusive right to print, reprint, publish, copy and sell the material covered by the copyright, too. The text of the King James Bible is the only text of over 200 English translations that has no financial copyright. Note, the copyright notices found in the King James Study Bibles do not cover the actual Bible text. These copyright notices pertain only to the publisher's notes and comments. The text of the King James Bible does not have a financial copyright. On the other hand, all of the modern versions have a copyright to protect their investment and retain control. The legal requirements of derivative works necessitate the use of assorted synonyms with greater and greater imprecision. Although the modern versions read more like our degenerating language today, their claims to be easier to understand are simply false and misleading. Understanding the truth of God's word and understanding the untruths conveyed by these modern Bibles are two different things. Even their claims to be on a lower reading level are spurious. Grade level indicator. The appeal of the new Bible translations stems from their perceived ability to communicate, not from their fidelity to the actual words of God. However, their ability to communicate does not mean that the right message, the truth, is being communicated. The publishers who produce and print the modern versions are not as concerned with a faithful rendering of the true text as they are with corporate profits and bottom line profits. Revenue generation, not the Spirit of God, is the driving force, 1 Timothy 6 verse 10. Shamefully, the criteria for acceptance of a Bible have become its perceived readability rather than its truthful accuracy. Understanding of God's Word comes by the Spirit of God, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14, and not the messenger. If it seems as though one can more easily read and understand the modern versions, this may have nothing to do with God's Spirit, the truth, or God's will. As we have seen, the modern version reader may understand something conveyed to him by Satan rather than by Almighty God. The claim of an easier reading Bible is a major modern version sales pitch. Is the KJB really harder to understand than the modern versions? According to all the sales hype, it is. However, the Flesh Kincaid Research Company's computerized grade-level indicator reveals that the King James Bible is the easiest of all the versions to read. In a selected analysis, the KJB reads on a 5.8 reading grade level, while the NIV reads on an 8.4 grade level, the NASV on a 6.1 grade level, today's English version on a 7.2, and the NKJV on a 6.9 grade level. Gen 1, Mal 1, Flesh Kincaid Grade Level, Indicator, Chart 1, Grade Level, KJB, 4.4, 4.6, NASV TEV, 5.14.75.1, Neve, 4.8, 5.4, NKJV, 5.2, 4.6, Matt, 1, Rev 1, Average, John 1, Gal 1, Jam, 1, 6.76.46.8, 7.57.1, 5.8, 8.4, 11, 8, 10.3, 7.76.47.7, 6.17.26.9, .7, Flesh Kincaid Grade Level, Indicator, Chart 2, Grade Level, NKJV, 3.9, KJB Neve NASV TV, 3.6, 3.6, One each of the three book types, Gospel, Pauline Epistle, and General Epistle, was surveyed to help ensure an honest assessment. The resulting data further confirms the readability of the KJB. Why is the King James Bible truly easier to read? The KJB uses one- and two-syllable words, while new versions are forced to substitute these simpler words with more complex multi-syllable words. As we have seen, their heady, high-minded vocabulary hides the hope of salvation from those seeking truth. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away, 2 Timothy 3 verses 1-5. The far-reaching consequences are immeasurable. 
Not only do these changes transmit errors and heresies, but they also cause unscriptural division, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10. Even simple truths once taken for granted by previous generations are no longer possible today. Multiversion congregations can no longer read the Bible in unison or agree upon what the Bible plainly states. Scriptural memorization has become a thing of the past. These problems occur on an individual basis as well as a congregational level. In God's divine wisdom, he provided man with an easy-to-memorize system. The KJB is written with a defined meter and rhythm making it the translation easiest to memorize. Satan knows and fears the consequences of a Christian who memorizes scripture. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119 verse 11 The Bible memorizing Christian has divine protection from within in the midst of temptation. Instead of producing the right type of fruit, i.e. great revivals, godly living, etc., the new versions have accelerated the moral decline increasingly prevalent today. Have the modern versions over the past five decades given the church revival and strengthened a God-fearing nation? No, instead, they have made it easier for Satan to corrupt and bankrupt this once great God-fearing nation. What is it going to take for America to wake up? How can she when Christians are asleep at the wheel? Some people wonder how such drastic changes could be perpetrated upon the public. Samuel Hemphill explains the phenomenon as a classic case of wolves in sheep's clothing. He points out this truth clearly in his book addressing the history of the Revised Version. Nor can it be too distinctly or too emphatically affirmed that the reluctance of the public could never have been overcome but for the studious moderation and apparently rigid conservatism which the advocates of revision were careful to adopt. 3. Hemphill asserts that there never would have been a revised version were it not for the moderation and conservative position outwardly displayed by the revisers. One can easily see that neither Westcott nor Hort was conservative or moderate in his beliefs. The same assessment holds for Origen and the entire cast of infidels. We can trace Satan's hand in every corrupt work. Interestingly, some of the men involved in the preparation of the modern versions have come to discover the truth and live to regret their involvement. Being men of character, these individuals have attempted to disassociate themselves from it. One such man was Drive S. Frank Logsdon. In the 1950s, Dr. Logsdon was invited by his businessman friend Franklin Dewey Lockman to prepare a feasibility study which led to the production of the new American Standard Version, NASF. Both men were involved at the very beginning and continued throughout the work. Logston helped interview some of the men who later served as translators. He also wrote the preface for the NASV. Many accounts exist of Dr. Logston's participation in the translation of the NASV. After receiving feedback from the publication of the NASV, Logston wanted to disassociate himself from the work. There are tapes and personal letters explaining his concerns. The following is one such letter, written by Dr. Logsdon to Cecil J. Carter. When questions began to reach me, pertaining to the NASV, at first I was quite offended. However, in attempting to answer, I began to sense that something was not right about the NASV. Upon investigation, I wrote my very dear friend, Mr. Lockman, explaining that I was forced to renounce all attachment to the NASV. I can aver that the project, NASV, was produced by thoroughly sincere men who had the best of intentions. The product, however, is grievous to my heart and helps to complicate matters in these already troublous times. Point four. Like others who have innocently associated themselves with these modern versions, Dr. Logsdon was convinced that a better, easier reading, more literal translation could be produced. When questions began surfacing, he soon regretted his relationship with this corrupt Bible. His character and integrity prompted him to do the right thing, but rectifying his error was virtually impossible. Many other men less principled than Dr. Logsdon have refused to admit their errors and their susceptibility to satanic influence. Unfortunately, the man that discovered the Sinaiticus manuscript was such an individual. Sinaiticus in May 1844, Constantine von Tischendorf discovered Codex Sinaiticus in a wastebasket in St. Catherine's Monastery as testified to by Dean Bergen in Revision Revised, page 319. The Greek text called Sinaiticus is believed to be one of the 50 manuscripts from those produced by Eusebius for the Emperor Constantine. Tischendorf's finds seem to destroy his judgment. 
Previous to this find, he had produced seven editions of his Greek New Testament. After the seventh, he declared that it was perfect and could not be improved. After he found the Sinaiticus manuscript, he produced his eighth Greek New Testament, which differed from his seventh in some 3,572 places. Thus, a Greek text was born that differed significantly from the Textus Receptus. Tischendorf's own words describe his discovery. It was at the foot of Mount Sinai, in the convent of St. Catherine, that I discovered the pearl of all my researches. In visiting the library of the monastery, in the month of May, 1844, I perceived in the middle of the great hall a large and wide basket full of old parchments, and the librarian, who was a man of information, told me that two heaps of papers like these, molded by time, had been already committed to the flames. What was my surprise to find amid this heap of papers a considerable number of sheets of a copy of the Old Testament in Greek, which seemed to me to be one of the most ancient that I had ever seen. The authorities of the convent allowed me to possess myself of a third of these parchments, or about 43 sheets, all the more readily as they were destined for the fire point five. Evidently, the antiquity of Sinaiticus convinced Tischendorf of the superiority of this manuscript. His Greek New Testament certainly reveals that he thought the St. Catherine's trash held the most important find of all time. The monastery was constructed at the foot of Mount Sinai by order of the Emperor Justinian to house the bones of St. Catherine of Alexandria. However, the bones of many others are housed there as well. The skulls of monks from across the centuries are heaped in a large room in the chapel of St. Trifon, also known as the Skull House. Reportedly, this heap of skulls is seven to eight feet high. The skeleton of one monk is left chained to the door adjacent to the mound of skulls as an ageless guard. Many visitors of this monastery have vividly described its atmosphere as eerily satanic. Did God really choose this wicked place to restore his unfulfilled promise of preservation? The Sinaiticus manuscript had been kept by these monks for centuries until it was discovered by Tischendorf, taken to Germany, and ultimately sold to Great Britain. It is now housed in the British Museum in London. The Sinaiticus and Vaticanus are the two primary manuscripts used by translators to justify the majority of the modern version changes. The justification used to convince the seminaries of the superiority of these texts is simply their age. The claim is made that the older a manuscript, the closer it is to the original source and the less the chance that it embodies corruption. Westcott and Hort used these manuscripts to produce their own text. First, however, they had to convince the revision committee that the prevailing text type was ecclesiastically sanctioned and corrupted in Antioch prior to AD 400. These men were able to convince the revision committee to reject the majority readings based on their fabricated theory, the Lucian Recension Theory. Westcott and Hort concocted an incredible fantasy to convince the committee members to reject the majority text and accept their text as authoritatively superior. They claimed that a council officially condemned and repressed the true readings, Alexandrian, while endorsing and propagating the false, Antiochian. Thus, they concluded, the great majority of manuscripts in existence supporting the King James Bible were Satan's handiwork and not the providence of God. This belief contradicts the historical record. For instance, Dean Bergen examined the writings of 76 church fathers. From fathers that died before AD 400, there were 2,630 references to the traditional text and only 1753 to the Westcott Hort type text. This fact conclusively proves that the traditional text was present before AD 400 and the traditional text outweighed the Westcott Hort type text by 3 to 2. This truth also disproves the Westcott and Hort theory that the received text originated during the 4th century. End of story? Westcott and Hort invented this theory so they could claim that they were following the oldest and best manuscripts. The testimony of the Church Fathers proves that the traditional text existed long before the era that Westcott and Hort claim. Westcott and Hort deliberately set out to construct a theory that would destroy the received text and support their neutral text. Jack Mormon gives an outline of their attack. These nine points form the basis for rejection of the received text and the acceptance of all future modern versions. Point two. 1. In textual criticism, the New Testament is to be treated like any other book. History reveals that Satan has always leveled his most vehement attack against Word Incarnate and the Written Word. The book that Satan vehemently hates cannot be treated like any other book. 2. 
There are no signs of deliberate falsification of the text. Thus, no reason exists to reject any of the readings that contain a doctrinally inferior position. 3. The numerical preponderance of the received text can be explained through genealogy. Basically, this means frequent copying of the same kind of defective manuscripts has given us the majority of texts which the KJB generally follows. 4. Despite its numerical advantage, the received text is merely one of several competing text types. By considering the majority text together as a group, its numerical superiority has no bearing on one's decision concerning which text type to choose. Although 95 to 99% of the texts may agree with the text behind the KJB, when considering the manuscripts from a text type perspective only, this places the corrupt texts on equal footing numerically with the majority text. 5. The received text is fuller because it is a conflated text that combined the shorter readings of the other competing text types. This conflation was hypothesized to have been produced with the official sanction of the Byzantine Church during the 4th century. Historical truth must be altered because received text readings existed prior to the time of this alleged conspiracy. 6. There are no distinctive received text readings in the writings of the Church Fathers before AD. 350. Dean Bergen and others have conclusively proved this premise to be absolutely false. The Syrian text dating back to the 2nd century further disproves this theory. 7. The shorter reading is to be preferred, on the assumption that a scribe would add material to the text. Also, the harder reading is to be preferred, on the assumption that a scribe would attempt to simplify the text. 8. The primary basis for a Greek text is to be found in Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. According to Hermann Huskier, these two witnesses disagree strongly with each other in 3036 locations in the Gospels alone. Mark 14 verses 55 to 56, Isaiah 8 verse 20. 9. Harmonization. Parallel passages in the New Testament were made to say the same thing. There is no proof offered for this theory, and it eliminates the established two or three witnesses requirement. Many witnesses have disproved these false premises and theories, but these two manuscripts still form the basis of every modern version. Having learned the truth about Westcott and Hort and their fictitious suppositions, many modern version proponents try to distance themselves from these men. However, new version translators basically accept and use the theories of Westcott and Hort and their text, disregarding the inconsistencies. They claim to use all the manuscript evidence, an eclectic approach, however, they still hold to the Westcott Hort theories. The Westcott Hort text is given preeminence in all the new versions. The preservation of the Syriac Peshitta version. Westcott and Hort knew that the existence of any traditional text readings prior to their self-proclaimed ecclesiastical corruption date would disprove their theory. The Syriac Peshitta, a text dating to about AD 150, was the historic Bible of the whole Syrian church. It closely agrees with the traditional text of the King James Bible. It attacked by Hort as the oldest Byzantine text. J.J. Ray in his classic book, God Wrote Only One Bible, irrefutably disproved the fabricated claims of Westcott and Hort. An excerpt from this work reads as follows. A number of good textual authorities state that the Bible of the Syrian Church, the Peshitta, was translated from the Greek Vulgate into Syrian about 158.d. This Peshitta version is admired by Syriac scholars as a careful, faithful, simple, direct, literal version, clear and forceful in style. These characteristics have given it the title the Queen of the Versions. Antioch was the capital of Syria where the early believers were first called Christians, Acts. 1126. In a few years, the Syrian believers could be numbered by the thousands. Their Bible, the Peshitta, even today, generally follows the received text. This is another proof that the foundation for the King James Bible is older and more reliable than the Vatican manuscript, which was elevated to the chair of authority by Westcott and Hort.2. Because the Peshitta dates back to the second century and predates both Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, the Peshitta's antiquity had to be denied by Westcott, Hort, and others seeking to undermine the traditional text. Such individuals also assert that all of the Byzantine texts were corrupted in unison, all over the world, in an attempt to explain why these texts read so similarly. Floyd Nolan Jones, quoting Bergen, Hills, and Pickering, conclusively proves Hort's theory false. 
The Peshitta bears witness to the KJB readings 100 years prior to either Vaticanus or Sinaiticus. 10. There are still approximately 350 copies of the Peshitta in existence today. It was at Antioch, capital of Syria, that the believers were first called Christians. And as time rolled on, the Syrian-speaking Christians could be numbered by the thousands. It is generally admitted that the Bible was translated from the original languages into Syrian about 150 AD. This version is known as the Peshitta, the correct or simple. This Bible even today generally follows the received text. One authority tells us this, the Peshitta in our days is found in use amongst the Nestorians, who have always kept it, by the Monophysites on the plains of Syria, the Christians of St. Thomas, in Malabar, and by the Maronites on the mountain terraces of Lebanon. 11. Westcott and Hort conceived a now discredited theory in support of a later date for the Peshitta. Many liberal scholars admit how wrong Westcott and Hort were, however, the fundamental evangelical experts still buy into their rewriting of history by accepting their text as authoritative. This disappointing truth parallels the promulgation of the evolutionary theory. Scientists disregard the fact that the underlying premises supporting their evolutionary position have been disproved. With a faulty foundation, the building eventually crumbles. Unfortunately, the builder asserts that the foundational flaws are simply minor imperfections that will work themselves out. Sadly, science and theology sometimes play by an unfortunate set of rules ignoring logic and truth in order to propagate a flawed agenda. The Noteworthy and the Notorious The cast of characters used by God to preserve the word of God have been greatly maligned by their detractors. We will consider only a few of these men and groups covering the last five centuries. These men are noteworthy in any study of church history or manuscript evidence for their faithful stand upon the word of God and the furtherance of the gospel. They truly were men of God. Identifying Satan's henchmen is much more important. These notorious men have done much damage through their dastardly deeds, all the while masquerading as good godly men. While many Bible critics purport these men to be in the same vein as those who stood for the received text, they are more aptly identified as infidels. The word of God that they worked to undermine actually warns us against them, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17. The Noteworthy Erasmus, Desiderius, 1469-1536 Dutch intellectual known as the journalist of scholarship credited with producing the world's first printed Greek New Testament. His decided preference for the readings of the Textus. Receptus over those of Codex Vaticanus, as supplied to him by the Catholic Sepulveda, found its fruition in the adage, Erasmus laid the egg and Luther hatched it. King James translators, the KJB translators faithfully translated the Textus Receptus into English. In 1604, a group of 54 scholars was chosen and divided into six teams, with each team assigned the task of translating a different portion of scripture. Each man on each team had to translate every word of his team's assigned portion. Then, these individual translations were collectively compared with those of the other team members. Discrepancies were voted on, bringing each team to agreement on its assigned portion of the scripture. Then, each team passed its work on to each of the other teams for their scrutiny and approval. Thus, each scripture was examined at least 14 times. The work took seven years and was completed in 1611. See Alexander McClure's Translators Revived, Maranatha Publications, or One Book One Authority by this author for further information. Scrivener, Prebendary FHA, 1813-1891 Conservative Anglican Scholar of Trinity College who contested with Hort during the decade when the Revision Committee was writing the Revised Version, 1871-1881. Bergen, Dean John William, 1813-1888 Outstanding Conservative Scholar of 19th Century Anglicanism. Dean of Chichester who repudiated Westcott and Hort concerning their text and the principles used by their revision committee. He supported the traditional text since he believed God preserved it through the Church Fathers as evidenced by their writings. According to Bergen, transmission of God's word was through supernatural means, not naturalistic ones. Westcott and Hort did not believe that the text was supernaturally preserved or protected. The Notorious Mark Ion the Heretic, 
D. 160 ancient enemy of the church, known for his repeated mutilation of the NT scriptures. Origen, Adamantius, 185 to 254 one-time headmaster of Alexandria's Catechetical School of Theology and Philosophy in Egypt. He is considered the church's first textual critic. He denied the existence of hell and believed stars were living creatures in possession of souls for which Christ died. After his Alexandrian excommunication for castrating himself, Origen took his mutilated manuscripts and migrated to Caesarea where he set up another school. Expiring in 254, he bequeathed his library to his favorite pupil Pamphilus. Upon his own death in 309, Pamphilus passed the corrupted readings of Origen onto Eusebius, infecting all subsequent generations through textual corruption. Eusebius of Caesarea, 260 to 340 ancient scholar known as the father of church history, who was commissioned by Emperor Constantine to produce 50 new Bibles. Many believe Vaticanus and Sinaiticus to be two of these 50 copies. Jerome, 342 to 420 Catholic scholar who produced the Latin Vulgate by revising the Itala version, or Old Latin, according to the readings of Codex Vaticanus. Semler, Johann Salomo, 1725 to 1791 professor of theology at Halley. He treated the Bible as a man-made book. He rejected the deity of Jesus Christ and the supernatural infallibility of scripture. Semler was the father of German rationalism and author of the accommodation theory, asserting that the Lord Jesus Christ and the apostles accommodated themselves to the prejudices, errors, and superstitions of their time. 12. He set forth the principle that it is morally permissible to lie about one's beliefs when speaking publicly because the audience doesn't have the background to understand the full truth. Thus, it was taught that the preacher could assert from the pulpit that he believed the scriptures were verbally inspired, inerrant, etc. in order to accommodate his congregation who was unlearned in textual criticism. Semler was the leader of the reaction in Germany against the traditional views of the canon of scripture. 13. Griesbach, Johann, 1745-1812 published three Greek editions between 1774 and 1806, proposing several families of witnesses, Alexandrian, Western, and Byzantine. He listed 15 canons for textual criticism and produced a text on these principles, departing from the Textus Receptus. He was a pupil of Semler. Latchman, Karl, 1793-1851 a German rationalist. He was basically a classicist rather than a theologian. He desired to produce a text based on the 4th century manuscripts. He thought it impossible to produce the text of the originals and rebuked his critics for following a late, impure text, the received text. 14 His text is based on two to four manuscripts, predominantly Vaticanus, and is considered to be the first critical text entirely casting aside the Textus Receptus. He treated the Bible like any other classical writing. However, his work was taken seriously by the textual critics because he furthered their objective of undermining the authority of the received text. Tischendorf, L. F. Constantine, 1815-1874 German textual critic who discovered Codex Sinaiticus in a trash can at St. Catherine's Monastery in 1844. He produced eight editions of his Greek New Testament. He respected and adhered to the conclusions of Griesbach and Latchman. Trigels, Samuel Prito, 1813-1875 published a critical text based on his own independent study. He was influential in the field of textual criticism in England with his views paralleling those of Latchman. Schaff, Philip, 1819-1893 ecumenical church historian and professor at the Apostate Union of Theological Seminary selected by the English Revision Committee to chair their American Advisory Board. Westcott, Brooke Foss, 1825-1901 liberal Anglican professor at Cambridge who conspired with Dr. Fenton Hort from 1853-1871 to produce a radical Greek New Testament predicated predominantly on Codex Vaticanus. Their corrupt text then became the catalyst for the English Revision Committee of 1871-1881 which resulted in the equally corrupt revised version New Testament of 1881. Their committee had not been charged with revising the Greek text but updating the English. 
When the revised version and Westcott and Hort's Greek text was published, they came under widespread condemnation for exceeding the authority of their appointment. Hort, Fenton John Anthony, 1828-1892 Cambridge professor who joined Burke Westcott in producing a Greek New Testament predominantly built upon the Codex Vaticanus and German scholars such as Lachmann, Griesbach, and Tischendorf. During the ensuing revision committee of 1871-1881, Dr. Hort took the lead in cramming this corrupt text down the throats of his fellow committee members. The end result was the equally perverted revised version New Testament of 1881. Westcott and Hort said they venerated the name of Griesbach above that of every other textual critic in the New Testament. 15. Nestle, Eberhand, 1851-1913 German scholar whose initial Greek New Testament of 1898 has undergone 26 editions to date. Used in the majority of Bible colleges and seminaries, the Nestle's text is basically identical to the text of Westcott and Hort. Kittle, Gerhard, 1888-1948, he edited the 10-volume standard reference work used in New Testament Greek word studies, the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. In Gerhard Kittle, Satan found a man used to destroy both the seed of Israel and the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. He was a dedicated Nazi who enthusiastically supported Adolf Hitler. His works were used to theologically justify exterminating the Jews. Kittel was put on trial for his key role in the extermination of two-thirds of Europe's Jewish population. Point 16. His father, Rudolf Kittel, was the author of Biblica Hebraica used by the New Versions to translate the Old Testament. Notorious 21st Century Critics A Few Examples the true Bible believer knows that his purpose in life includes being a defender of the faith. However, many men and women seem to have purposes contrary to this God-given objective. Instead of standing for the pure, preserved word of God, they expend their energies undermining the truth. We have discussed a few of the individuals involved in this insidious attempt by Satan to destroy the truth of God. Here are the comments of a few more of the Bible critics. Kutilek, Doug, the Westcott and Hort text is much simpler to define. This is the Greek New Testament edited by B. F. Westcott and F. J. A. Hort and first published in 1881 with numerous reprints in the century since. It is probably the single most famous of the so-called critical texts, perhaps because of the scholarly eminence of its editors, meaning the esteemed infidels of Westcott and Hort, perhaps because it was issued the same year as the English revised version which followed a text rather like the Westcott-Hort text. It needs to be stated clearly that the text of Westcott and Hort was not the first printed Greek testament that deliberately and substantially departed from the Textus Receptus on the basis of manuscript evidence from the corrupt Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. Westcott and Hort were preceded in the late 1700s by Griesbach and in the 1800s by Latchman, Alford, Trigels, and Tischendorf, and others, all of whose texts made numerous revisions in the Textus Receptus on the basis of manuscript evidence, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, etc. These texts, especially the last three named, are very frequently in agreement with Westcott and Hort. Against the Textus Receptus, peas in a pod. None of the major modern English Bible translations made since World War II use the Westcott-Hort text as its base, because Westcott and Hort's corrupt text has produced the corrupt Nestle's and United Bible Society texts. This includes translations done by theological conservatives the New American Standard Bible, the New International Version, the New King James, for examples, and translations done by theological liberals the Revised Standard Version, the New English Bible, the Good News Bible, etc. The only English Bible translation currently in print that the writer is aware of which is based on the Westcott-Hort text is the New World Translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Reader, do you recognize what Mr. Kudelek has just admitted? He says the Christ-rejecting Jehovah's Witnesses are the only ones still using the Westcott and Hort text. What does that reveal about this text and the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus from which it came? What does it say about all the modern versions following the same ungodly line of corruption? Mr. Kudelek continues, On the other hand, the defects of the Westcott-Hort text are also generally recognized, particularly its excessive reliance on Manuscript B, Vaticanus, and to a lesser extent, Aleph, Sinaiticus. Hort declared the combined testimony of these two manuscripts to be all but a guarantee that a reading was original. What a clear condemnation of their position. All scholars today recognize this as being an extreme and unwarranted point of view. 
Manuscript B, Vaticanus, shows the same kinds of scribal ores found in all manuscripts, a fact to be recognized and such singular readings to be rejected, as in fact they sometimes were rejected by Westcott and Hort, e.g., at Matthew 6 verse 33, point 17. Ross, Bob L. The inspired word of God came in the original Hebrew and Greek writings, 2 Peter 1 verse 21. A translation into English or any other language is the inspired word of God to the extent it properly translates the languages in which the scriptures were first written. I have never read a commentary or respectable book which did not at one place or another clarify or correct what was regarded by the writers as a misleading or erroneous. Translation One of the primary purposes of books and the study of them is to determine the true meaning of the Hebrew and Greek writings, as we do not always have it complete in any single translation. 18. Hudson, Gary R. Here are two interesting statements which reveal this critic's knowledge of the variations and existence of the varying texts. The word omission and verse comparison charts distributed by KJOS, King James Onlys, would not work to discredit the NKJV because the NKJV New Testament had retained all of those words and verses omitted in the New Bibles, Acts 8 verse 37, 1 John 5 verse 7, etc. All translations must be evaluated on the basis of their accuracy to their own underlying texts. 19. Using this evaluation standard would mean that any version that accurately translates the underlying text is acceptable whether or not that underlying text is accurate. This is sheer lunacy. Hudson's infidelity again shows in the next statement made by him, the following is a brief list of readings from the KJV where ambiguity and or mistranslation obscures the true meaning of the original. 20. Carson. D.A. In 1979, Carson released his book deceptively entitled, The King James Version Debate, A Plea for Realism. Here is one quote to give a clear sense of his Alexandrian position. What shall we say too about the vast majority of evangelical scholars, including men in whom were found the utmost piety and fidelity to the word, along with a scholarship second to none? These men hold that in the basic textual theory Westcott and Hort were right, and that the church stands greatly in their debt. 21. Emphasis Mine Had the vast majority of these scholars read the life and letters of B.F. Westcott, by his son, and life and letters of F.J.A. Hort, by his son, they would realize that the peers of Westcott and Hort did not identify them with the utmost piety and fidelity, nor had their scholarship level reached second to none. Instead, Westcott and Hort deliberately sought to deceive those they could influence through their outward appearance of orthodoxy. Not only did Carson have an incorrect view of two of the most insidious men to ever influence the church, but his position also undermines the supernatural approach to scriptural preservation. He offers a naturalistic approach apart from God. The supernatural approach starts with God's promise of preservation and ends with his perfect word. Anything short of this method is humanistic and certainly not spiritual. Carson also ignorantly stresses conflation and harmonization just as James White's book proclaims many years later. A clear distinction and division between those who have stood for the truth and those who have been busy undermining it should now be readily apparent. When truth and error are examined side by side, the facts become clear. Continually highlighting these dividing lines remains the job of those familiar with the issue. Shamefully, our seminaries have frequently become the instigators behind this propagation of error rather than the advocates of truth. Satan has used these institutions to convince young Protestant and Baptist Bible students that their Reformation text is unreliable and their authorized version has grave inaccuracies. Furthermore, they have even taught that some of the modern versions are superior to the KJB. Once these Greek and Hebrew professors have convinced their students that they no longer have God's word, these young men naturally attack their own English Bible and believe they are doing service to God in the process. The extent of the problem becomes clear to anyone who has listened to churches using every conceivable advertising gimmick to unscripturally gain numbers. Check it out for yourself. Ask a pastor which version he and his church use to get a clear indication of the extent of the problem. There will be a clear distinction between those who stand for one book and those failing to take a stand because they do not grasp the seriousness of the issue. The plethora of modern versions used from the pulpits bears witness to this phenomenon. If you pick and choose, you become the authority and your own God.
Now that we have examined some simple facts about the Bible version debate, it is time to consider how these changes impact even the simplest of Bible truths. The next chapter is dedicated to a single topic sorely lacking in today's church's prayer and fasting. 1 NIV page 796 to the New Standard Encyclopedia, Volume 3, page 565. 3 Hemphill History of the Revised Version, Op. Sit, page 25. For letter to Cecil J. Carter on June 9, 77 from Drivass, Franklin Logston, 1807, Hemlock Avenue, Prince George, British Columbia, Canada V2L1J3, Maranath at mag-net.com. 5. Tischendorf's Report, Codex Sinaiticus, page 23-24. 6. Grady, Final Authority, Op. Sit, page 32. 7. Jack Mormon, Prever Settled, Part 5 A Survey of English Bible History, N.J., Collingswood, Bible Today, page 197, 198. 8. Herman Huskier, Codex B and its allies, Volume 1, A Study and an Indictment, London, Bernard Quaritch. 9. Jasper James Ray, God Wrote Only One Bible, Junction City, Oregon, The Eye Opener Publishers, 1955, pages 97 to 98. 10. Jones, Which Version is the Bible? Op. Sit, pages 164 to 167. 11. David Otis Fuller, Which Bible? Grand Rapids, Michigan, Grand Rapids International Publications, 1975, pages 197 to 198. 12 If the Foundations Be Destroyed, Trinitarian Bible Society Article, No. 14, page 1. 13 Vincent, A History of the Textual Criticism of the New Testament, Op. Sit, page 92. 14 Metzger, The Text of the New Testament, Op. Sit, Page 124. 15 Introduction, The New Testament in the Original Greek, page 185. 16 Robert P. Erickson, Theologians under Hitler, Gerhard Kittel, Paul Althaus, and Emmanuel Hirsch, New Haven, Connecticut, Yale University Press, 1985. 17 Doug Kudelek, Westcott and Hort v. Textus Receptus, which is superior, 1996. 18 Bob L. Ross, King James Only Hokey. 19 Garrier Hudson, The Superior Accuracy of the NKJV to the KJV's Textus Receptus. 20 Hudson, Problems in the King James Version. 21 Carson, DA. The King James Version Debate, A Plea for Realism, Grand Rapids, Michigan, Baker Book House, 1979, page 75.